When the scribes and Pharisees asked our Lord about the greatest commandment, he replied, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. So why do we hear some of today's most prominent pastors saying things like this? It had everything to do with how we talk about the Bible, and specifically point to as the foundation. We need to love the Lord with all of our souls and respond to the worldview issues of our day with the wisdom and discernment that comes only from Him. We need to love the Lord with our minds and understand the calling of God's people in every area of life in God's world. We need to love the Lord our God with all our strength and face the work of building a life-giving, God-honoring culture. Join us for 10 days at the Runner Academy for Cultural Leadership as we consider how the gospel influences all of life and culture and the role that we have to play in applying foundational Christian thinking to every area of life. I would say if the authorities didn't want us involved in the public square, they ought not to have crucified Jesus in the public square. Use humanistic principles. Well, I would say the Dan, same idea. Yeah, I would say same that. Hand. I would say, what's the problem with stardust bumping into stardust? In the in the cosmic picture, no, there's no problem. In the oh, cosmic right. picture, it won't matter. No, Mr. President, you are not protecting reproductive freedom. You are authorizing the destruction of freedom for one million little human beings every year. I'm sorry, my friends, but I am tired of seeing Jesus presented as a weak beggar. He is a powerful Savior, and the Gospel is not a suggestion, it is a command. Reverend Mola, don't you sympathize with that? I sympathize with every single human heart wishing to know the one true and living God, but I believe there's only one way that that can happen through Jesus Christ, and the Gospel is about repenting of sin, not celebrating it. adventure. We will explore the spiritual abyss. You have not experienced this before. You're going to love it. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day john chapter six everybody it's a big one it's a big one get it that's really the summary of much of what we're saying in this uh apology radio series defending calvinism today we're talking about total depravity or total inability welcome back to another episode of apology radio this is the gospel heard around the world i'm jeff the call a ninja and that's Zachary Conover, hey, hey. Director of Communications for End Abortion Now. Thank you so much for joining us. Go and get more at ApologiaStudios.com. That's A-P-O-L-O-G-I-A Studios.com. Get more. There's tons there, guys. Lots of stuff there. If you sign up for all access, you partner with us in this ministry. You make everything that we're doing possible from, yes, things with End Abortion Now to all the on-the-street evangelism, the teaching ministry, all that, everything going on at Apologia Studios is made possible because people just like you are partnering with us in this ministry. But when you go to Apologia Studios and you get all access, we want to bless all of you who are partnering with, with us in the ministry with even more. And so we've got the Academy, 
great stuff at the Academy on prayer, on Christian apologetics. We're doing something right now on end time stuff with the Great Tribulation. That's underway right now. Almost finished with that. That's coming, so be in prayer for that and be looking for that. We also have the after show of Apologia Radio. After we air here on YouTube, it goes right to the, to the Apologia Studios page, and we continue the discussion over there. We also have Collision over there, full episodes of Collision at Apologia Studios for all access. And of course, you have all of the hundreds of episodes of Apologia Radio, Sheologians, you've got Provoked and Cultish, all there. But don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. Wait, there's more. More. You've got to go and get it if you haven't done it already. I'm telling you. It's, it's one of the most uh, rigorous and uh, amazing seminary-level educations you can get, uh, and it's free from Apologia Studios. Thanks to the Bonson family and trusting us with it. It's Dr. Greg Bonson's life's work. It's a treasury. It is Bonson church history, you. philosophy, Christian apologetics, the Bible, biblical texts. I mean, everything there. It's literally his seminary edu- uh, lectures and, and his stuff from church, too. <laughs> the funny uh, thing about that is someone was asking me on the uh, page, hey, can you recommend a good philosophical work to go with the Bonson lectures? And I'm like, those lectures are a great philosophical yeah, work. Just yeah. listen to them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so it, it'll, be, it'll be a blessing to you. So listen, I mean, it's great for your family. It's great for your individual enrichment. It's great for Bible studies. And it's free, like legit. You just get an account. And so yeah. go to apologiastudios.com. <laughs> free 99. That's right, free 99. Go, and you, you go to get the Bonson U account. It's going to be free. You log in. Uh, uh, David Bonson, Dr. Greg Bonson's son, wants to make sure the world gets access to his dad's teachings, and, and we do too. And so he entrusted us with it, and so we're giving it to you for free. Now, I want to say also big thanks to everyone who's Apologia Studios All Access, because though it's free for you to do, uh, it's being funded by uh, everybody who's all access. Because it's costly it, for other people. Because believe it or not, and actually every time someone clicks something on the website, uh, we have to pay for it. And so it's it's free-ish. Uh, somebody is paying for that. Um, and so Bonson you, don't forget to go get that. Thank you guys for joining us. We... Uh, thought that we would continue that discussion that Zach and I had a couple of weeks ago now on uh, Calvinism, Mm -hmm. the doctrines of grace, and uh, we think it's an important subject because so much of it uh, provides a foundation to the grace of God in the gospel. So many of you uh, remarked on how it was just a blessing to listen to an hour or so of teaching, and we started with the sovereignty of God, uh, and stulip. Stulip, yeah. And, and they, of course, if, if you're getting, if you're new to this discussion about Calvinism and the doctrines of grace, uh, you've probably heard uh, Tulip, uh, Total Depravity, Unconditional Election, Limited Atonement, Irresistible Grace, and the Perseverance of the Saints. Uh, we like to start that discussion, as uh, my fellow elder uh, and, and has, has remarked on, with uh, the, the real foundation underneath all of it, and that's the sovereignty of God. So we call it Stulip or Stupip and whatever. Which is basically just a way of saying we're reasoning from God. Downward, right. yes, right. We're not starting with man as the creature. Yeah, so I mean, a- admittedly, and this is nothing to be ashamed of. It's it's exactly where you need to go in this this discussion about the the grace of God and salvation. The discussion about predestination, election, all of that has to start with the foundation of the Word of God. What do the Scriptures say? So, of course, underneath the sovereignty of God component of this discussion is is the affirmation of sola scriptura or Oh, uh, the revelation of God is supreme, that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are the rule of faith by which we should measure this discussion. What does God say? Not in one place, but throughout his revelation on this. And so, so of course, affirmation of sola scriptura and affirmation of the sovereignty of God it, over all things, the comprehensive sovereignty of God. And then we get into the discussion about the nature of man, uh, God's electing grace. Uh, did the atonement accomplish anything? Was it a potential atonement, right. a potential right. salvation, or was it a particular atonement that actually accomplished God's will for the atonement? Um, uh, what power does God have to convert sinners? Uh, and when God saves somebody, does he keep them? Mm-hmm. That's the question. And so we're going to get into those. You guys are really blessed by that discussion. We're blessed to have it. It always yes. is a blessing to talk about these things because it brings glory to God. It makes much of God. It makes little of us. And so today we're going to be talking about total depravity or, as as I like to refer to it, total inability. Yeah. Uh, many people prefer that terminology. R.C. Sproul used radical corruption yeah. also. 
yeah, so uh, great ways to express it. And it really just has to do with the nature of man in the fall. Are we dead in sins and trespasses or are we spiritually sick? Um, uh, do we go with what the Bible says when it says people are unable to come to God apart from God drawing them, that they have no ability or is their will free? Are they truly free? Do people come into the world with a tabula rasa, a blank slate? Mm -hmm. um, or do people come into the world dead in their sins and trespasses um, inheriting, of course, that condemnation from uh, Adam, our first parent. Uh, what is our condition? Are we by nature children of wrath, or do we all come into this world as uh, children of God? Right? Uh, Which what's is the popular teaching today? That's the popular right? teaching yeah. of, of today, exactly. And so we're going to get into that today, but before we do, just real quick so that we don't get uh, messed up in the discussion we're having, I wanted to, you guys are probably all seeing this, and you've probably heard talk about this before, uh, is, does Jeff have uh, a problem? Uh, what is what is this patch going on here? What weird thing is going on? And so I like to announce it because I'm a big, big believer in it. It's a Christian-owned company, and I'm so grateful to God for what they have come up with. This is an NAD patch. Uh, NAD, NAD patch, and um, you guys maybe have heard me talk about this before. Uh, again, I'm a big believer in, in, the, in people creating things that extend human life and bless human life. And so NAD is something that you have uh, available within your system. It's just a God-given uh, uh, biochemical. It's something in your system. It's referred to as the fountain of youth because it's the it's the uh, chemical or the, the 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 what's in your system uh, that helps to keep everything operating. Your it feeds everything, and so your cells are kept in, uh, in in the state that they're supposed to be. Everything's working properly because you have an abundance of NAD when you are younger, an abundance of it, and so that's why they call it the fountain of youth because you got so much of it and it keeps everything working the way it's supposed to. If you went without NAD in your system for thirty seconds, you'd be dead. That's how important it is to your system. As you get older, um, your levels of NAD drop uh, pretty dramatically, like, you know, like half. And so, you know, you start to age, you get older and you're aging because, you know, a number of reasons. And one of the things is you don't have as much NAD anymore. And so a lot of people, uh, wealthy people, uh, uh, sports stars, athletes, all that stuff, they've been in on the NAD for a long time. And what they have done, you may even heard uh, Joe Rogan talking about it when he got the, the vid. Um, he did uh, NAD IV treatment, and he also did uh, some other stuff. But he announced it, and so people were like, what's NAD? Uh, but NAD has been used for a long time, helping people recover, get their systems back online. Um, but the problem is, and this is what I was always afraid of, it. the problem is, is that NAD through an IV, everyone knows is torture. I, I, I don't exactly, I know there's a reason why, and you can look it up. But it's it, it's torture. People talk about having an elephant on their chest. It's 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 very very difficult to endure. And more costly to obtain. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's like an hour long process to get that IV drip to happen. And sometimes people say they have to just stop midway and say turn it, just turn it off. And as soon as you turn it off, nice. like it stops. But as soon as you turn it back on, that drip is happening. It's like really really uh, painful. So people do it anyways because the benefits of like get Beauty that is pain. <laughs> yeah, get that NAD drip, and then like you, like my friend said, it felt like your Iron Man. You can like knock down walls afterwards. And my friend, good friend of mine, someone I love dearly, um, a famous baseball player, um, after a hip replacement surgery, he did it, and he was like exercising a week later or something. It's just insane to get a hip surgery, and then a hip replacement, and then be working out like that. And so anyway, uh, my wife and I. I got connected to this company, Ion Layer, and Ion Layer does it through a patch so you don't have the torture of the IV drip. And like Zach said, it is significantly cheaper. You're looking at like $800 for a drip. So they've made it more accessible. Yeah, and this is a medical patch. Audience. Uh, where it gets into your system over like 14 hours and you 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 just skip over all the pain and all the difficulty and you actually get fresh NAD because you mix it yourself and um, you get a, a lot of it. And so it's just way, way cheaper and it's just such a blessing to our bodies and human life. You may have heard me mention that um, when I started taking it and my, my clarity of thought was so much better um, I was able to think without fog. I was like really impressed with that. Felt like a lot of really clean, amazing energy. Not like caffeine, just I felt good. I felt healthy, good. I felt really, really good, vibrant. My wife had like uh, the long vid symptoms where she had no, uh, she had favorite smells were all like, they smelled like sewage. 
uh, coffee tasted like garbage, all that stuff for like two years. And she thought she was going to be stuck with it for life. I mean, she legitimately thought this, this is just what I got to deal with. Coffee's going to taste like hot garbage. And uh, so we got these in, gave it to her. And it was like, I think three days later. And she was like, I got two of my smells and tastes back. Now take that for what it is. She, the only thing different she did is she did the NAD patch and then it came back. And so I'm grateful to God for that. I thank God for this company. I thank God for these brothers uh, who are who are over this company. I'm so thankful for things like this that bless and prolong human life. Um, and so, yeah. It, it, so if you go to ionlayer.com, ionlayer.com, and you go put in Apologia in the, uh, I think it's all caps, in the coupon code, uh, they give you a big discount. Love them. Uh, I have to be just be honest as we as we have these discussions in a show like this. So many people have uh, regularly ask us to be a part of Apologia Radio and to have their stuff put on Apologia Radio. Honestly, we turn uh, the vast majority of it down. Um, if I don't truly believe in something, it's not going up on our program. Um, I really love these guys. I love this product. I love this. I love what it does. I love how it blesses human life. I love their business. I love the fact that they're believers. And so that's why we're talking about it on the show, because I am just, I'm really grateful for it. I really, really am. It's really helped me because I'm 45 years old right now, 45 years old right now. And I've noticed old man. the muscles ain't working as quickly as they used to. And so I have to train extra hard to get where I need to be. You know, pull, pull a hammy on a sidekick or what? It happened to me like a year and a half ago. I was training hard again, you know, and then one day hard. I, 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 I run every day and I do martial arts and all this stuff. And so I come around the bend of my house and then the last, the last part I sprint as hard as I can because I'm exhausted. I'm like, fight, push, push. And so I just start to sprint. I get a halfway to up my, my driveway and I'm just like, bloop, and like hammy blew out. There like, goes. And so that, but anyway, I've been recovering faster with NAD now. Um, I can I can work harder and and not uh, uh, experience like the week long pain stuff. And so that's how it's, that's what it's done for me. So that's what we wanted to do is tell you about that. So ionlayer.com, go there, check it out. Uh, it'll it, I, I think it'll be a real blessing to your life. And so let's get into it. When you think about total inability, Zach, why, why, okay, first of all, why do you believe it and why do you think it's important to, to know and defend it at uh, that particular starting point, total depravity, total inability? You know, I was thinking about this very thing and asking myself, anytime we do studying the word or we're preparing to teach or instruct, it's really the so what of it all that comes at the end. Like yep. what's at stake here? like getting this right why is it so important to get it right it's actually one of my favorites of the acrostic to discuss because i think if you fail here then you get everything else wrong that's exactly right um so what's at stake uh, the grace of god i would say in the gospel um and by extension to that the fact that you know if we get grace right then we understand that god isn't under any compulsion to give it yeah to anybody right um if he is if he's compelled to do this if he must uh, then it's no longer grace uh, grace loses its graciousness i think when we get the condition of man wrong so when we're talking about total inability total depravity radical corruption really what we're talking about is to what extent has mankind fallen um everyone agrees that the whole human race fell in adam the Bible teaches very, very clearly um, the doctrine of original sin, that all of us have a representative outside of Christ, and his name is Adam. He's our first father. Um, but where the dispute tends to come in this is, well, how serious was the effect of the fall on our human nature? Yeah. Like, how far reaching is sin's corruption, actually? Like, does it touch every part of us, or is there something preserved from sin's corrupting effects upon us. We all know that our bodies wear out and get sick and we die. We all know that our thoughts are corrupt and futile outside of Christ. Um, but is there something intact that hasn't been touched by sin? You know, our reason, for example, our human reason. Are we able to actually come to God? Um, so um, it's not utter depravity, right? That's not what we're saying when we talk about total depravity in that we're humanity in our fallen state is as evil as we possibly could be um it's it, it's not that it's that um you know because god has preserved us in many ways by his grace from 
going off the deep end and falling into complete sin and, and God, self God, destruction. It, and to that point, God it is is constantly restraining man constantly. from the evil that he wants to do. Right, yeah. and, and that's that's the key right there is desire, motivation, will. Um, you know what we're talking about in this is not that you know people don't make choices. You know, fallen man makes choices. It's what's the nature of that choice and what does man desire in the natural state apart from God? And the answer to that is it's not God. Right. He, he's not looking for God. He's not running towards God. When you ask the question, what does the Bible have to say about our condition? We're enemies. We're rebels. We're hostile against God. We're, we're disobedient. Um, children of wrath is the other and you're quite all in all those identifiers you just gave you're those just you're, you're literally quoting scripture right yeah. right and so every part of us has been touched by sin um it's not that we're as evil as we possibly could be but there isn't a part of us that hasn't been affected by the fall and we're talking in that sense about the nature of man yeah. in the fall right that's the main issue is what's yeah. the what is the nature of man in the fall yeah. we're, we're held captive to a master and the bible defines that master as sin. And of course, there is description about us, you know, the the, the bondage of the will, the mm -hmm. famous book by right. Martin Luther. Luther that's versus a, Erasmus. That's a biblical definition of our, of our, our fallen estate, is mm -hmm. that we're captive to Satan, uh, we're captive to uh, the bondage of sin, and therefore, we cannot originate the love of God within our own hearts. We can't affect our own conversion, and we cannot do that which is spiritually pleasing to God. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about here. Um, not can we have moments of virtue in our lives, you know, when we help a neighbor across the street or we, you know, give to the poor. Unbelievers can do those things, mm -hmm. too, by mm -hmm. common grace. There's atheist charities. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there's a, a Lorraine Bettner referred to this as even in man's charity, there's a fatal defect. In yeah, his yeah, goodness. yeah. No, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, there's a fatal defect in right. his goodness, and that is his motivations are all wrong. He's not doing it for the glory of God, and he's not doing it in independence upon God's power, right, to carry it out because he thinks that he is self-originating, self-sustaining, self-existent, apparently, yeah. um, in his idolatrous condition, in his desire to be completely separate from God. Which, by the way, is how the Bible refers to um, how we are. You know, we 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 don't want God in our knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want the the reminders of God and creation it's all Romans, around Romans us, one. constantly screaming at us yeah. that he exists, yeah. that he's the creator and that we're accountable to him. Um, you know, we want to do our own thing. And so um, to that point, real quickly, quickly, uh, Gordon Stein, there's a part in the Gordon Stein, Greg Bonson debate on the existence of God. Where I think it's near the end of the debate where they start talking about atheists doing good things. Yeah. And Stein, as an atheist, says that himself out of his own mouth. He says it by his own mouth. He says, no, atheists do good, do, do good things, he said. And there are many atheist charities. He goes, and the great thing about not believing in God and all this is that when you do these good things, you get the credit for it. Yeah. That's what he said. Yeah, yeah. And so it's like, well, there's yeah, the departure. So there's the departure. Right. So you're not doing it for the glory of God, for the, for the good of the image of God. You're doing it because you want the credit for it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's the distinction is that man can do those good things in and of themselves, but whatever does not proceed from a heart of faith is sin. The Bible tells us, mm -hmm. um, Romans 14, I believe. So, um, what's the motivation? Is it self aggrandizing? Um, is it to have a name and fame with the world? Is it to, to, to be viewed in a more morally positive light? None of those things, um, are w the kind of righteousness that mm -hmm. God commands us to have. Yeah. And the point about righteousness is that it's an inward renovation of God by the spirit mm -hmm. that, so when we're talking about total inability, the Ethiopian, you know, uh, can't change uh, himself, it, right? Yeah, yeah. The le leopard can't change its spots, right? Right. This is how we are by nature, and we cannot change ourselves. Right. We can't. The, the decisive hinge point of salvation does not come from within us. It has to come from outside of us. Mm -hmm. It has to come from a power acting upon us. And of course, that comes later on in the tulip with regeneration. Yeah, irresistible the, grace. Yes, the inward yeah. renewal of the person. That's what has to take place because uh, apart from that, we're, we're hopeless. Uh, Ephesians chapter two describes our condition in which it says that uh, 
were separated from the Commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, talking about the Gentiles, mm -hmm. um, having no hope and without God in the world. Mm -hmm. That's the condition. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd love for you to talk about Ephesians chapter two as well in the beginning there, dead in trespasses and sins. Yeah. But just maybe set up the discussion that way. Yeah. Uh, we are unable, we don't have the power um, to come to God. We can't do that, which is spiritually pleasing to him. That's right. And a lot of Christians will hear all the verses. You're literally, you're just speaking scripture right now. You're taking little snippets of verses and pulling yep. it into conversation. And there's more. And I know mm. there's more, but a lot of Christians will say, well, I agree with all that and I'm still not reformed. And I would say, okay, it's one thing to acknowledge that that's what the Bible says that we are by nature children of wrath, that we're dead in our sins and trespasses, we're hostile, all of that, unable to come to God. It's another thing to actually allow your theology to actually express it. Now mm -hmm. now I believe that's true about you to the degree that now it impacts my evangelism. Precisely. It, it impacts my view of man and the grace of God and salvation. So the real question here with Tulip is just this, how gracious is God's grace? That's the key issue. And the reason why I'm bringing that up now is because we're going to get into a ton of scripture here. But in terms of people understanding the particulars of where this dispute arises in Christian history, this, this is really important. So in Christian history, literally, in, it's in the pages of scripture themselves in the New Testament record. The um, ancient record of the church is the New Testament itself. So if you want to know about what the ancient church was like, read the New Testament. Right. Uh, that's the ancient rec record of the church. And in that ancient record of the church, you've got now evidence that the apostles, the inspired apostles, are having to contend with yeah. um, opposition that looks like Christianity. So this came as a response to something. Exactly. So, so in the New Testament itself, you see the marks of the dispute going on between the early Gnostics and the Christians. Mm -hmm. And the early Gnostics were using Christian language. They were borrowing Christian terminology, but they were seen as enemies of the Christian church. And so you've got the Apostle John and the Apostle Paul dealing with the early beginnings of Gnosticism. And so my point is, is like they're having, they're having to deal with heretical and apostate theology in the pages of the New Testament itself. And then you get out of the apostolic era and you move into the second century. And now what are you dealing with? Well, the church has to contend with other things like, again, Gnosticism. You're, uh, they are the enemies of the Christian church. So the second century of the church, Christians are now having to deal with, these are the disciples of the apostles. They're having to deal with the Gnostics. And then you have like Marcion, and you've got the attempt to pull sort of a Andy Stanley of the second yeah. century, and that's the, the, OG the, Andy yeah, the OG Andy Stanley in a sense, and and detach the Old Testament scriptures from the New Testament. And so they're having to deal with that nonsense, and the early Christian church having to deal with Sabellianism and modalism. And as you start to move forward in history, let's just be honest, not everything is on the map in terms of theological disputes. Some of the main things the church is having to deal with is you're having to deal with the authoritative record of the church, that is the inspired writings. You're having to deal with that and contend with Marcionites and all that stuff. But you're also having to deal in those first few centuries, I mean, in a big way, like the premier issues, the big ticket items is the nature of God, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, because then you start right. moving forward. And now what are you dealing with? Well, you're dealing with issues like Arianism, Bishop mm -hmm. Arius of Alexandria. You got to fight against that heretic who's teaching, you know, a Unitarian perspective and that Jesus is this first and greatest creation of, of God sort of a thing, like early on, that, that kind of thing. And so the church is not having to fight every single spiritual battle at once in the first few centuries. There's sort of like the big ticket items like the Trinity. Who is God? Who is God? Yeah. The deity of Christ. You're dealing with those kind of big ticket items. Now, as time goes on, though, yeah, you're dealing with like Augustine has to deal with Pelagius and you got, of course, Augustine is, 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 is squarely on the side of the Reformation when it comes to like monergism yeah. in so many ways. Like, look, uh, you're going to find a mess in Christian history. It's a beautiful mess. You're going to find the giants of the faith saying the things that sound just like Paul and Jesus, and you're going to see them face planning. And so you yeah. do like, look, As Augustine, all history. <laughs> Augustine is a, a, is a premier example of this. And this is really important as you get into the discussion of total depravity and like where this comes and this dispute in the Reformation. Augustine is just this giant. I look, I love Augustine. I named my son after him. Okay. Um, he's a giant. He teaches that the rule he teaches in many ways, Sola Scriptura. I mean, some of the greatest um, discourses about Sola Scriptura 
are from Augustine. I mean, his talking about the rule of faith, and I don't care what this person said or that person said. If it doesn't match the Old and New Testaments, it's not true. It's not binding. He says things like that. It's like, well, that's just pure sola scriptura, right? That well, well, right there. Welcome to the Reformation. But Augustine also staunchly defends monergism because he's fighting against Pelagianism, right? And so you're like, dude, Augustine is on the side of the reformers here. And then at the same time, you're going to find Augustine where the the Roman Catholics are quoting from him because he's saying stuff that the Roman Catholics love. And you're like, yeah, I acknowledge it. Look, Augustine was a uninspired, fallible man. And you got him saying great things that are in accordance with the scriptures and other things that Rome loves. But here's the point. You move forward in history and of course, you've got the schism and you've got the, the separation of the East versus the West. Time goes on and the West, uh, you talk about Rome, just starts adding on so much over time doctrinal uh, perversion and starts adding things and binding things to the consciences of people that are not A, in the Bible and B, in church history. Um, and that's one of the things the reformers were arguing about with Rome is they're like, look, you guys have departed from scripture and church history. So the reformers regularly, regularly quoted from the fathers. They, their, their argument was like, this is not a theological novum. We're not giving you something new. This stuff is in the whole history of the church. You'll find it everywhere. And so when you get into the time of the actual reformation itself, by that time, there is so much theological darkness. Rome has face planted to such a degree that a reformation is necessary and a call back to the rule of faith. Now, what does it center around? The reformation is centering around a couple things that are in orbit with each other. And one of those things primarily is what's the final authority here? Because you guys are pulling rabbits out of a hat here, guys. I mean, this isn't in scripture or church history. Like where, where are you going? Is, is, is the papacy just gets to just make stuff up now? This person over here just gets to define? Eastern yeah. Orthodox, they don't even agree with the papacy. They, like the reformers are going, they agree with us on this. Like you pulled a rabbit out of the hat with this one. You're not even going to find this in early church history. This role, this infallible interpreter, this guy, uh, this position of the papacy. Look, even Eastern Orthodox, they don't agree with you on this. It's not just the reformers. Like we're in tandem on this. You guys pulled that out of a hat. And so the Refor Reformation was clearly saying, well, what is going to be the final authority here, guys? Because church history is beautiful and it's messy. You're going to find so much testimony to the truth found in Scripture, and you're going to find guys that contradict themselves and each other. And so where's your where's your rule of faith? Do you go with Augustine? Are you going to go with Athanasius? That the rule of faith is the Scriptures it, themselves? And so here's the thing. It goes squarely to Sola Scriptura, what's the ultimate authority, and then... Because of everything that was going on in terms of Rome and indulgences and paying money to spring people out of purgatory and paying money for yourself and your own sins, all this stuff that Rome adds, what comes front and center during the time of the Reformation? The grace of God and salvation. The question of the Reformation was, how gracious is God's grace? Yeah. How free is this gift? And so that's why... In the whole like spectrum of church history, you get to a point where it's like, all right, now the fight is on here. It wasn't on in the first few centuries of the church like this. During the time of the Reformation, it wasn't even it wasn't even a major focus. There was no target over it because they're dealing with other things like trying not to mm -hmm. die from Roman soldiers, you know, throwing them into an arena or or burning all their books. Uh, they're just trying to survive. And then it's defend the Trinity, defend the Trinity. Like it's it's those sorts of issues. Reformation, now it's like, well, wait a minute. Is this salvation truly of God's grace? Mm -hmm. And what's the nature of God's grace? And better, what's the nature of man in the fall? And so you get to the time of the Reformation, the reformers are, are actually coming to Rome and going, you don't agree with the Bible. You don't agree with points of church history. Like, you, you need to repent. And so, of course, Reformation happens. And then as time moves on in Reformation, that's where this tulip comes from. Because now you have, and I'm not going to make this whole show about the history of Tulip, but you need to study this history because it's important. Calvinists didn't just pull Tulip out and say, this is really cute, let's do this. No, the followers of Jacob Arminius um, formed a remonstrance, an official protest. And it's like, we don't agree with what all that you guys are teaching here about the grace of God, the nature of man and salvation, the atonement as a perfect atonement, saving forever. We don't really agree with that. And so they had a remonstrance a protest, and they gave their points. And what did the Reformed community at that time do? They took a heck of a lot of time, a lot of time, with a lot of coming together and a, a lot of pastors, 
scholars, theologians, missionaries to come together around the scriptures to form an official response mm -hmm. to the remonstrance to the followers of Jacob Arminius. And so in history, it became known as Calvinism versus Arminianism, because that's where the fight took place. And I want to just say it's very important. This whole thing about Calvinism, I'm not a Calvinist. I don't follow a guy named John Calvin. Well, neither do I. Uh, I've never actually read John Calvin's stuff. I've seen quotes from him I appreciate and things I'm like, oh, that's nice, but I've never actually sat and read through John Calvin. I'm not a Calvinist because of anything to do with John Calvin. As a matter of fact, ultimately, Calvinism has nothing to do with a man, John Calvin. It has to do with a theological title over a fight. And that fight goes to Scripture and says, what does the Scripture say about the grace of God and salvation, the atonement itself, how God saves, the nature of man in the fall? Mm -hmm. And so it just becomes a title, like Trinit Trinitarian. Is the word Trinity in the Bible? No. But it's a title over a system, so it can express in a punch exactly where you're at on the issue. And Calvinism, I take the title gladly, because that title expresses a view of the nature of man and the atonement itself and God's power and salvation and the grace of God and salvation. And so I take that gladly. And it's got nothing to do with the man named John Calvin. It has to do with just a title over the dispute. Where do you land on this dispute? And I say, well, I'm a Calvinist because I believe these things about what the Bible teaches about that. So that's where this fight ultimately came from. And it's important for us to recognize this is just the way the history, the history has gone. This is the point in history where the grace of God and salvation was really put to a point and the fight brewed over it. And the question is, what do the scriptures say? That's where we need to land. So that's what we're going to do on today's show. Yeah, it's you say it all the time and you said it often in the past. You know, when I started hearing about these things, it was never about Calvinism and adhering to the teachings of John Calvin. It was always about what did Jesus say? Right. What did Paul say? What did Peter say? So, boy, how were you convinced of Calvinism? By reading John? Right. Were you? Yeah. Uh, no, um, no, no, sorry, John Calvin. Oh, no. Yeah, you, John the Apostle. John the Apostle. That, and that's the point. Yeah. Is that you were convinced of total depravity and tulip mm -hmm. and the doctrines of grace. Yeah, a reformed soteriology. You were basically. convinced because the Bible. Mm -hmm. It wasn't from John Calvin. It wasn't from John Knox. Yeah. It wasn't from the Puritans. You were convinced because you read scripture. Right. Yeah. Pa passages like Romans chapter eight, verse seven, the mind that is set on the flesh, which is the unregenerate mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This verse was huge because we have to ask the question as a follow up is having saving faith in Jesus Christ pleasing to God. Yes. The Bible says that it, the person in the flesh can't do that. They don't have the power. They can't, they can't do as pleasing to God like repent. Yeah, they don't have the faculties within themselves, the power, the ability, however you want to say it. They, they are not capable of doing that which pleases God. They can't submit to God's law. Uh, they're not even able to do so. Right. Because there's the portrait painted there in Romans chapter 8. There's the mind that's set on the flesh and the mind that's set on the spirit. And those who have the spirit of Christ belong to Christ. And the point is, for those that have their minds set on the flesh, they can't submit to God's law. Well, are you submitting to God's law? Has it become your delight? Has it become a source of joy for you as a believer, as a Christian, um, that when there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, um, and yet the spirit is alive within you to actually facilitate and cultivate these desires now because you see the gospel as something that is excellent and beauty and praiseworthy and lovely and something that's worthy of your whole life and you actually have a desire to obey God now well that's the mind that's set on the spirit you can please God but not the mind set on the flesh not the natural man in his unregenerate state so when someone hears the gospel presented to them in an unregenerate carnal worldly state they can even affirm it as historically true they could say yes yeah, okay, that happened. <laughs> but here's the point. They cannot create the love of God in their hearts for God and for that message. That's something that God has to do. <clears throat> they don't want to because they're hostile to God. And that actually um, brings it to, you know, a passage like, I mean, another one. This is just, I know I'm firing off the hip here. So Ephesians 4, 17, something that you just said made this verse kind of leap to the forefront there about what does man want to do? Um, you know, what's in his heart? What is within his desire to do? Ephesians four seventeen. 
Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. So why can they not see? Why or from where does the ignorance come from? Their hardness of heart. They, they can't see because they won't see. They, they refuse to see. Yes, that's uh, very important. J Jesus uh, comments on the same idea. He says, you refuse to come to me that you may have life, right? You, you, you don't want to come. Um, you're not seeing. And once again, on this point of total inability, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, the natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God for they are folly to him. What else does the book of 1 Corinthians tell us about the word of the cross? It's moronic to those who are perishing. It's foolishness. It's a foolish message to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the gift of life. And he's not able, 1 Corinthians 2.14, to understand these things, right? The things of God, because they are spiritually discerned. Now, what does that mean? It means that the spirit has to be the one to come and apply the understanding to the hearts of man and, and give him, of course, the appropriate thoughts that go along with that. But these texts are just a few examples that highlight really what we're talking about. Man being unable to come to God, man being unable to do that, which is spiritually pleasing to God, because born in his natural estate, he is not free. Very important. I, I think that's a very critical thing to say. He, he doesn't possess a free will, which is merely a philosophical concept mm -hmm. that I don't think is rooted in scripture, but he does have a self will. He is making choices. He is doing things, but those choices will always be in accordance with what he desires. So, so the, the, the nature feeds the will. Yes. The activity is dictated by the nature of yeah. the person. So many places bear this out. One of my favorites, and I think it really gets overlooked, is when Jesus is d denouncing his contemporaries, and he says, how can you do good when you are evil? Can a bad tree bring forth good fruit? Well, the answer is no, because what's at the heart of the tree? A bad root. Right. Right. The, the seed of life isn't there to bring about the root, and because there's no root, there's going to be rotten fruit. Right. The, the point is there has to be something done yeah. inside. Otherwise, you have passages like John three nineteen again, presenting just what the scripture says here, Jesus. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. What's our natural inclination to love darkness? to not want our works to come to light, to be exposed. Why? Because they're evil. And why are they evil? Because of the problem of sin Yeah, and its effects on our nature. I was watching a video uh, yesterday or two days ago, and it was uh, footage of like one of those drive-through safari things. You know, people drive through safaris where there's like like real lions. And, yeah, like you know, walking alongside the cars. Yeah, and stuff. exactly. Those yeah. things are terrifying. Yeah. Monkeys <laughs> are jumping up on your on your up. hood and they're you know pulling off your windshield wipers <laughs> and you're pulling Bears, off the side like view two, mirrors. Yeah. Well, it was a uh, it was footage, the security footage of of uh, of a car that was driving through one of those um, uh, drive through safaris, and the car stops and this foolish woman jumps out of the car, a passenger side of the car, runs over to the driver's side. Now, the description of the video is like woman gets attacked by a lion because she decides to have a dispute with her husband or something like that. So I don't know if that's really what was going on. It looked like it was going on. Like the car stops, the woman jumps out. She comes over to the driver's side. Looks like she's like you having words with the driver. and But she's in the middle of an active drive through safari. And, uh, you know, you're watching it, you're like, oh, no, this is, is this really going to go bad? And sure enough, like the moment she gets to the driver's side, starts disputing with the driver, this huge lion comes running up behind her, grabs her and drags her off. Yeah. And the, I think I saw this the driver jumps out of the car and he's like freaking out, like he didn't know what to do and everything. And it's like, everyone's freaking out. It's like, well, and if you ask the question, like, well, why is, why would the lion do that? Yeah. And the answer is, because it's a lion. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's doing It's his nature. What is his nature to do? Lions do
which is why you don't hang out in parks with like lions walking around. Why? Because you know that that lion will do lion stuff. Yeah. And which means it'll it'll involve you in a way you don't want. And so like the same thing goes with like this this video I just saw this morning. Uh, this guy on a Florida uh, highway gets out of his car and there's a the alligator. Uh, or, or crocodile. I never. I was getting mixed up. I don't know which was which. Uh, I don't know how to. It's just apart. walking down the highway, and he's like, he's he's standing above it. He's like, yeah, ah, yelling at it, and he's like, like smacking uh, its nose. Smart. And I'm like, you buffoon! Like, what? Just you know, why why do that? But he's trying to get it off the highway. But and you're thinking like, wh- why does it why does it bring so much anxiety when you see things like that? Because you know the nature of the alligator. Yeah. You know what it's capable of. It's not you, a bunny rabbit. You know what it wants to do. And so the thing is is that what we're saying about the nature of man in the fall is that he's making choices. He's not a robot. Look, we have to honestly represent our opponents, right? Mm -hmm. It's very important. Christians have a tendency at times to fall off a cliff either side. Christians have a tendency, all of us do, to be imbalanced. And Christians, the one thing we shouldn't do is ever misrepresent somebody because we're lying. We're lying about them. So I don't want to misrepresent an opponent. Mm -hmm. I don't want to give a fiction about what they believe. And I certainly don't want to attack a straw man. We're not helping anything we attack a straw man. So when someone says, like, I don't believe in Calvinism, Reformed theology, it makes men robots and all the rest. It's like, um, you know, if God has already determined who's going to save, nothing matters. Why are you bothering praying? I would actually turn it back on the Arminian and I would say, oh, why are you praying? Because if you don't think God can mess with his free will and, you know, God's done everything he can, but the mighty will of the creature will thwart God's uh, desire, why are you praying? Um, I'm praying because I believe that God decrees the ends as well as the means. And uh, so all that to say, um, when we talk about this, this issue, we're not talking about human beings as robots or that they're making decisions apart from their own nature and will. They're doing what they want to do. Yeah. God is not having anybody sin against their will. Right. So like even when God hardens the heart of Pharaoh to sin against God, like Pharaoh is a rebel against God, hates God, hates God's people, wants to sin against God. When God hardens his heart judicially, so that he's even more sinful and rebellious, yeah. even to the point where he's not, God's not going to allow him to preserve his own skin, right? Like, no, no, mm-hmm. I'm going to let you be as hard as you are. I'm going to let you be as hard as you want to be. I'm going to harden your heart so you are going to just go down that, that, that pit of sin as far as you want to go. When God hardens his heart, he's not making Pharaoh do what he doesn't want to do. Yeah. Pharaoh loves to be hard. Pharaoh loves to sin against God. Pharaoh hates God. And so even when God, for his own sovereign purposes, is directing, say the Gentiles, the peoples of Israel, Pilate, Pontius Pilate, and Herod, yeah. to do what they did, even when he allows them to do what they did and decrees that they would, they're doing what they want to do. And if they could have gotten their hands on Jesus and killed him any earlier, they would have. And by the way, yeah. they tried. Yeah. Uh, but, but it, it wasn't, wasn't his time. time. Yeah, right. And he says, no one takes my life from me. I lay down of my own accord. It was only when God had predetermined that this would occur that it actually occurred. And the point is, is that Herod, Pontius Pilate, the peoples of Israel and Gentiles were doing what they wanted to do. They hate God. Yep. And if they hate, listen, humans are so sinful. I've said this often. Humans are so sinful and rebellious against God. We hate God so much that if God could get himself off his throne and come down here and get flesh on him, we would kill him. And we did. Right. And, and that's the key and when issue. we can't get a hold of him, like the day and age we now live in, we'll go after his image bearers. Oh, kill it. Yeah, exactly. Those that bear his image right. of the most innocence. Yes. Very good. Talking about the issue of abortion. Exactly. So uh, the issue about the will is not people are robots. They're doing, they're just doing, you know, they don't even know what's going on. They're just sort of droning on. No, they're making choices, but the nature feeds the will. Right. They are doing what is in accordance with their nature. And so what we're saying is, is that people are enslaved to sin, like Jesus says, and unless the son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. So slaves don't sound free to me. Jesus says, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. So I don't know where we ever get the concept biblically of people have a free will. Jesus says they're enslaved and he has to set you free. So we're saying Mm -hmm. that your will is enslaved. It's in bondage because your nature is a son or daughter of Adam and Eve. You are in the fall, Romans 5, 12 and 19. Sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. So death spread to all men because all sinned. By the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So look, like it or lump it, that's what the Bible teaches. You don't like original sin? Hey, neither did Pelagius. 
but it's the historic teaching of the church, baby. And so it's not just the historic teaching of the church. It's what the Bible teaches. You are either in Adam, Romans 5, or you're in Christ. One has condemnation and death, rebellion, hostility, and one has the gift of eternal life and righteousness. So you're in one of two representatives. And if you're in Adam, it says that you're dead. It says that you're condemned. And so that's the state of man in the fall. His nature is fallen. His will is fed by his nature. He does fallen things because he's a fallen person. So That's right. Um, 2 Timothy 2, 24. It's a passage talking about the Lord's servant, uh, the minister, the servant of God's word. He must be quarrelsome, must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach. I was going to say, I felt, I felt weird. <laughs> Hopefully Some... won't be, he won't be quarrelsome. <laughs> Something was off there. <laughs> he must not be quarrelsome, <laughs> but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to, to do, do his, his will. will. Yeah. So once again, speaking about the slavery yeah. of mankind, he yeah. is a bondage to sin. Romans chapter six. What's that glorious passage all about when God actually takes us and unites us to Christ, right? Which is symbolized through baptism. And now Jesus has joined his life to ours and we're in him safe, clothed in his righteousness. His spirit now lives within us. His presence is actually bringing about the life that God requires. And we have a new master. We've been delivered from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of God's beloved son. And we don't serve the old master anymore. Now we can actually bring forth works that are pleasing to God because the nature has changed. There's something different now that wasn't there before. And that something different that we're talking about, of course, is the grace of God. And the idea behind this is that he's the one that must provide that. Man cannot even prepare himself unto salvation that's the 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 level of his inability so not only can he not convert himself but he can't even abide by the preparatory uh things to to get close yeah <laughs> god's the one that has to do this whole thing well and and it's as simple as as romans chapter three there is no god yeah. seeker right now look here's the thing it's one of those things as a christian is like you read that a thousand times it's like but do you actually allow yeah that truth and its implications come into your theology yeah there is none righteous no not one there is none who seeks for god so if nobody in the world is righteous and no one's seeking god pray tell how does anybody do it yeah and the answer has to be found in the sovereign god of scripture and not in ourselves mm-hmm. because you know we can just give the the wave of the hand like yeah i believe those verses no hold on now Wait, 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 wait. Wait, you're seeking God, though. Wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> I'm seeking God. Wait what just happened? a second. When you talk about this free will and, and all this stuff, it says that no one seeks for God. So how does anybody do it if no one does it? No one's yeah. seeking God. And the answer is going to be found squarely in Scripture. It's like this is something that God does. God grants repentance. God grants faith. Philippians one twenty nine, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Uh, and Hebrews actually says without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's right. So who gives faith? So if there's no one righteous, no one living is righteous, and no one seeks for God, then how is anybody saved? And the answer has to be found in God. and With his, God, all things are possible. Exactly. And his accomplished work and what he does in salvation. And the problem is, is this dispute gets to a place where there's so many people that will give the wave of the hand at the scriptures and say, well, yeah, 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 I believe all that. But it still has to be a cooperative effort sort of yeah. situation. It's like still got to be the synergistic two things working together in tandem. God and me, we're working together sort of as a joint effort in salvation. Yeah. And it's like, well, wait a second. No, 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 no. Allow those verses to really tell the story. Because what we're saying is Reformed folks and Calvinists who believe in the doctrines of grace, I really believe those texts. Mm. I believe they're true. I believe that... We're unable to come to God unless the Father draws us. And if the Father draws me, I will be raised yeah. up. That's the promise of Jesus in John right. 6, 44. I believe Romans chapter 3. All that catena of verses from Romans 3 that tells the whole story of the depravity of man and the sinfulness of man, not righteous, not good, non-God seeking, poison of asps under their lips, no fear of God before their eyes. I really believe that. I believe that that's the state of the person taking my order at Starbucks who doesn't know Jesus. Yeah. That super sweet barista or the, the crazy zany person at Dutch Bros that will not shut up. I know they talk so like, much. Like, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. As nice and as sweet as they are and the common grace that's there, right? I believe that if they don't know Jesus, they are not righteous, they're not good, they're non-God seeking. Mm-hmm. And they will not pursue God because Romans chapter one clearly says 
Everybody knows the true God. They all know the true God. Romans chapter 1. It says the problem is that they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And why is there so many false religions in the world? Why is there so much idolatry? It's not because God is far off and unknown. It's because God is specifically known. He's, mm -hmm. he's known clearly, but they don't want him, Paul says, in their knowledge, meaning they don't want to know him. They don't want to think about him. They don't want to know him. They suppress the truth of God and unrighteousness, and they switch the true God for an idol. And so the point there is that even in Paul's description of like this, 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 this portrait of humanity in the fall, that they know the true God, they suppress the truth of God, the point is, is that they're not doing this in ignorance. Yeah. They're doing it knowingly, willingly, it's but they're self deceived. Yes. We're not saying that the unbeliever is walking around going, I know the true God and I hate him and I'm going to pretend like I don't. Right. The point, the point is a schism. it's self-deception. Right. They are so sinful and rebellious that they are self-deceived. And so what do people do? They choose the creature mm -hmm. rather than the creator. They choose like idolatry is so stupid. I was talking about this at church what two weekends ago. I was like, it's so stupid. Like you got people like that, that put these like stupid little idols up in their restaurants and like little cat, little gold cat, little arm flapping up and down or something like that or like this Buddha or something like that. It's like, it's so dumb. Yeah. Powered by a motor that has to be maintained right, and repaired right. when it breaks. Right. Do you realize how dumb this is? Yeah. Like, this is this so is dumb. Like you're bowing down this is more. so dumb. <laughs> like, this was made from the stuff that God produced yeah. with a human being that God made to put this on a, on a stand and it doesn't move. It's dumb. It's deaf. It's non-seeing. It's non-hearing. It doesn't benefit you at all. And you worship this thing and you go, that's so foolish. And the point is, is that foolishness is actually... Uh, they're culpable for it yeah. because they know the true God, according to Paul, but they don't want him and their knowledge. So they suppress the truth of God and unrighteousness. And they are what it says in Romans one enemies of God. That's how the Bible talks about the relationship of fallen man and the true God is that they are enemies of God hostile to God. Ephesians chapter two says they are by nature children of wrath, not children of God via adoption. They are by nature children of wrath. And Paul says, you're dead in your sins and trespasses. The, the, the standard evangelical out there, or even the Roman Catholic, I want to say, look do, you, look, do we really believe that? Does that have any meaning mm -hmm. at all? Or is it just, is it just hyper? Hyperbole? Is it just some sort of poetic language? Or is it actually the consistent thematic thing throughout scripture? You're dead. You're condemned. You're hostile to God. You're an enemy of God. You know the true God. You switch him for idols. You're unable to come to God. And that's total inability. Can we get that whole verse there? Which one? Ephesians 2. Yeah. And you are dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Like the rest of mankind. Like, the rest of like mankind. everybody else. Like everybody else belonging to the unregenerate, carnal, worldly pattern and mindset yeah. that, that you have been delivered from. You've yeah. been redeemed from this. Yeah. So this is what you once were because there comes that beautiful uh, truth that packs a punch in verse four, but God, yeah, God who is rich in mercy, right? When you didn't deserve this, uh, you weren't looking for it. He did this yeah. by grace. Have you been saved? Yeah. And by the way, that it's important to note in terms of context, not proof texting, whole discourses in context. Ephesians two comes right after Ephesians one. Mm -hmm. And Ephesians one is that really sticky section about, yeah, from about he, three, verse 3 to 14. Yeah, <laughs> he chose us yes. in him before the foundation of the world. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, that, that starts off with the whole discussion of predestination and what God does. And then it moves into, here's where you were, yeah. dead in your sins and trespasses. But then what you pointed out is for... Ephesians 2, 4 says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And then he defines it by grace. You have been saved. Huge. Made us alive. Yeah. So That's what we're talking here's about. what's key. And I want to just encourage everyone just to I'm humbly encourage you. Just think about this. He's just talked about predestination, choosing us in Christ before the foundation of the world. And then he goes into describing our condition before God saved us. You were dead by nature, children of wrath. And that being dead has to mean something. Does it mean it? Like you were dead, spiritually dead, a, a, by nature, a child of wrath. The walking He's, dead. He says, <laughs> but God, 
he says, made us alive. Who did the aliving there? Mm -hmm. God did. God made us alive together with him. And he says this, ready? By grace, you've been saved. So for, and this is so key. And that, not of yourself. Yeah, he says, (laughs) dead, but God made you alive. By grace, you've been saved. So for Paul in Ephesians 2, this is really key. We love we love as Christians to quote Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. Yeah. Um, By grace, you've been saved. And you're already all finishing for me right now. You're finishing it. By grace, you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not according to works, lest any man should boast. We all know that by heart. I hope you know it by heart. But notice that that Ephesians 2, 8, 9 comes after Ephesians 4 and he's already defined what the grace part means. That's right. Yeah. You were dead. God made you alive. By grace, you've been saved. So if you want to read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 in its real context, he already told you what the by grace part means. Right. And that was that you were dead and God made you alive. Oh, and it's also through faith. And that, the grace and the faith, not of yourselves, the gift of God, not according to works. Could the Apostle Paul, the inspired Apostle, be any clearer as to what our nature was, what our plight was, and how God corrected it, and all to his glory. And even when it says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, that this is not of us, not according to works, lest a man should boast, he says in verse 10, watch this, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's like from the beginning to the end, It's God, 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 God raising your life, God giving you faith, and God preparing beforehand the works that you would walk in, the good works that you would do. It's God, 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 nothing to do with you. And and, and I said this, and I'll hand this over to you. I said this when I taught on the comprehensive sovereignty of God two weeks ago. We find this offensive. Right. Because we're so prideful, we've got to have some part in this. Yeah. It's not just, I said, unbelievers that find the sovereignty of God offensive. Oh, no. They don't want his rule. Like, it's obvious. You, the average unbeliever, you get, like, why are they mad at the sovereignty of God? Mm-hmm. Because they don't like God being king and reigning over all things and being in control. Like, they're already at war with this God. So you get why, like, they hate the sovereignty of God, his rule, his reign. But there are also professing Christians, I made the point, that also hate this truth of the sovereignty of God because there's still some bit of, of pride, human pride. And if it's true, there's no claim for you to it. What do you have whatsoever. to boast in? It's all God? You mean it's all God? Yeah, none of you. You mean it had nothing to do with... No, nothing to do with you. You weren't smarter. You weren't stronger. You weren't more yeah. spiritual. You didn't understand more. It was God, God, God. Because you and I were not righteous, not good, and you weren't seeking for God. He was seeking you. By grace, you've been saved. He raised you up. Yeah. Several objections in the realm of evangelism, even. People don't want to believe that those that they come across could be hostile to God, enemies of God, the sweet person in front of me that just seems confused and in need of more information. Um, and then even, you know, people themselves just, they make comments like, well, if that's the God you're talking about, I don't know if I could believe in a God like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't believe it. I don't know if I could believe in the God of Matthew eleven twenty seven. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Wait, he did what? So you have Jesus, (laughs) you have Jesus praising the father for hiding truth from somebody. Yep. People don't like that. Yes, father, for such was your gracious will. Gracious. That was gracious of you to do that father. Yeah. Um, Again, um, you know, the father raises the dead and gives them life, but so also he is, uh, the, the son gives life to whom he will. This is God's prerogative to do what he pleases, which brings us back to sovereignty of last time that we talked. Yeah. This is a direct connection here to the sovereignty of God. Jesus is walking through a graveyard. He's walking through a graveyard and he bids some to come to life and mm-hmm. others he passes over. Right. And people don't like that, Zach. Because it is they very say, offensive. Because they say that's not fair, mm-hmm. which tells you what about their anthropology that they think that people aren't so bad. Yeah. They think people aren't really culpable. And that God isn't so holy. Right. They, they think that the violations of God's law are not so dramatic as mm-hmm. to put people into a state of complete hostility towards God and judgment. 
And so really what that expresses, when you gave that, per, I think, perfect illustration, the son gives life to whom he wills. He's walking through a graveyard of dead people. That's what scripture calls all yeah. of humanity is dead in sins and trespasses. And he gives life to whom he wills. He raises up people graciously. And people say, but what about the other one that's still on the ground? Yeah. Oh, you mean the one that's hostile to God, enemy of God, suppressing the truth of God and unrighteousness, the one who's not righteous, the one who's not good, the one who's not God-seeking, the one who it says is the poison of asps under their lips, the one who has no fear of God before their eyes? So that's the point is that, wait a second, if we actually describe the person who remains in the grave dead accurately, you would go, why did God give grace to anybody? Why is anybody getting this grace? Why is the son of man coming in and speaking life into dead people who hate him? Yeah. That's what makes the gospel so glorious and his grace so glorious because he's doing this for me and you and others who trust in Christ. He's doing this for people who actually didn't want him. Yeah. I should still be in the grave. I should still be hostile to God. The fact that he saved me is to his glory and it's not to mine. I wasn't deserving. I wasn't even looking for him. That's what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And so the real, when some, everyone always wants to say, they always to say, well, that's not fair. And that means, well, you need to get your anthropology straight because your anthropology is not biblical. Mm-hmm. It, 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 we hate God in the fall. Yeah. yeah. People say, really? Hate God? Yeah. It says haters of God. Yeah. That's, that's what it says. Enemies of God, haters of God. That's where we're at. Unable to come to God, hostile to God, by nature, children of wrath, debtors and trespasses, <laughs> condemnation, all that stuff, enslaved to our sin. And just humbly to submit this too us because we do struggle with believing that people are this way and even some Christians struggle believing it about themselves Um, who are we going to believe whose word are we going to take at the end of the day you know when we encounter someone that we're trying to share our faith with are we going to believe what they say about themselves are we going to believe what God says about them right that really is where the theory moves into the realm of application is when we're witnessing, when we're sharing the gospel, when we're making the mercies of God and salvation known to our neighbor, upon what basis are we approaching them? And what does the scripture say about their condition? Because if we deny that this is the testimony of scripture, that they're dead, they can't hear then we will be tempted to adopt some other means other than just the pure preaching of God's word in order to affect their change. Or we will be so demoralized, um, you know, thinking that, well, we didn't do this right. We should have shared this. We should have said it this way, you know, coming away from those conversations. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we have to understand that this person is dead and it's not you. You are not the thing that's going to save this person. You're the instrument in the hands of the maker and it's his word in your mouth that's going to raise the dead to life right it's his word that has to do that but if if we don't believe that the person is beyond hope as the scripture says in a sense right without hope and without god in the world then that means that nothing you can do can actually do this it has to be god speaking through you that's right that actually saves a person saves anyone the gospel is the power of god for salvation right dunamis yeah same word we use for dynamite. Yeah, and you mentioned means. It's the yeah. means by which someone is raised. Yeah, it's the means by which someone is quickened and brought from spiritual death to spiritual life. Um, Jesus says, "It's your favorite verse. Whoever hears my word and believes in Him who sent me has, has eternal, eternal life." life. Yeah, it's it's the word itself. That, That's right. That and this is all over the scriptures. But the the apostles are adamant about this. It's the word of God that has created the Christian church has created the fellowship of God's people. Um, This is the gospel that was preached to you, the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. In other words, this word made you Mm -hmm. right. He, James says, brought us forth by the word of truth. That word, if you look at what it means, I love it. It it, it literally means he, he, he conceived you, right? You you are conceived as a believer by the seed of God's word. Mm. And he brought you forth. He brought you, uh, not only out of darkness into light, but he brought to new birth, mm-hmm. right? So that language of conception and, and, and new birth and new mm-hmm. life there mm-hmm. of his own will, mm-hmm. he brought you forth. Yeah. Very, very critical of his own will. He did this mm-hmm. because he wanted to, it, it was his determination. It was his foreordination. It was his 
execution and application of the Spirit's work in your life that actually brought about uh, this condition of peace that you now enjoy with God, in which you're not a rebel anymore. You once were. And can I have you speak to this? I wanted to ask you about this. Maybe we can end or get close to ending on this point. Because yeah. I think some believers struggle with this sometimes when they hear this doctrine preached. And the scripture teaches it, I believe it with all my heart. But they'll say like, well, does this mean then? I feel like you're still categorizing me as a Christian as this no good, worthless you know, garbage person. I feel like a bad person when you're mm -hmm. preaching total depravity at me, that I'm an mm -hmm. enemy and I'm hostile against yeah, yeah. God and I can't do these things. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Like as a Christian no. now? Okay. And, and that's, that's, uh, we have to always be willing to correct things even within our own camp. Yeah. Like, and I feel like when we hear this, even some people, maybe they grew up with a bad upbringing. Maybe they grew up being told they were a, a piece of garbage. Mm -hmm. um, and so now they associate when they hear being told, no, man is hostile. He's a rebel. He doesn't want God. He hates God. He's no good. He's worthless. There's a little bit of crossover mm -hmm. between their experience and the testimony of scripture. Exactly. And I think the difference can be seen in how the apostle Paul or how the new Testament speaks to a congregation and beloved loved by God. Yeah. Grace and peace saints. Right. And so the set apart ones, the ones who have been sanctified, saints. Object of God's love. And I think it's important to note, too, in terms of Contra Rome, um, this whole idea of like this special class of saint people sort of thing. It's like, well, well, it's interesting that the Apostle Paul feels very, very comfortable just announcing to a congregation of professing Christians that you are saints set apart by God. You are saints. So you yeah. are God's living. Holy ones. You are living saints, living saints. It's actually possible to be a living saint. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, here's, here's the key issue on this point. When I say being willing to correct things even within our, within our own camp, sometimes reform folks can be so good on total depravity. It's not bad. Like so good on like this is what the scriptures teach about the nature of man and the fall. That's what God does in salvation. They could be so good at expressing that, that they sort of carry that over into the Christian life mm -hmm. and they continue to talk about themselves right. in light of what scripture says about them pre-Christ. Yeah, And it's like, well, well, hold on just a second. Scripture actually has us now with a new identity. You're not in the Adam identity any longer. You're in the new Adam. You're in Christ and his identity. You're and a so, new creature. Now. New creature. You are righteous in Christ. You have the gift of righteousness. God does not count your sins against you. He does not treat you as your serve. He separated as far as the east is from the west. He counts you righteous apart from your works. You have peace with God. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The list goes on. And so we're saints. And so though you can say things like, in myself... I was like this, yes. but now I'm alive in God. Yeah, I'm righteous anymore. in Jesus. And so, no, it, it isn't appropriate, and we need to correct in the Reformed community. It isn't appropriate to keep dragging the old condemnations into the current life. Yeah. Because really how we should be speaking is, of course, honestly about our sin, but also honestly about our position in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Our identity is in Jesus, which means that you should talk about yourself now in Christ the way that the Bible does. Because yeah. it speaks very differently. There's, there's a big difference between the flesh and the spirit, the old life and the new man, um, the new creation and the old creation. There's a big difference. And so I think one of the things that's healthy for us is to continuously meditate upon and believe God's word about our condition now, yeah. as opposed to how it was. And that's not a man-centered exercise. That's a delight in what God says about his child. You're landing like, right on his word. This is the declaration yeah. that he has spoken over you. He I, sings over you. I'm arguing the opposite. I'm arguing that you better stop looking to man, stop looking to your own inner monologue, stop looking to your circumstances, and just believe what the Father says about his children. Because the more you delight in what God says about you, the more glorified he is. Right. Right? At the end of the day. Yeah. At the end of the day, if you're more satisfied in God, he's more glorified. Yeah. I mean, that's the point of Piper and all his works. Yeah. Is that if you are enjoying your status, if you go into God's presence knowing that you're fully accepted, that there's nothing you have to bring in order to gain entry into the very throne room itself, that you're going there with the stamp of God's approval on you, with an advocate who will never fail you. Who with always, a perfect sacrifice. Yes, and his record is, is, has no blot in it. There's no stain That's right. that affects your entry uh, before him into his presence. And he'll always hear your prayers and 
you know, he'll always make sure that the deficiency in your prayers is even taken to the throne room and given everything that it needs to be acceptable and pleasing. Yeah. Even, your stupid, even your stupid yeah. prayers. Even your, hey, Lord, it's me again. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Lord. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You're yeah, totally messed up prayer life. Right. Um, it, yeah. It's really important. And so we'll, we're going to go into the after show in a moment here, guys. Uh, I think we did a long show today. I wasn't even paying attention to the time. I think it was a long show. So we're doing an after show in just a moment here. Meet us over at apologiastudios.com. But I want to at least pull the text we're going to start to talk about, and we're just going to do two in the after show, really big ones, discourses from the Lord Jesus. I started the show today reading from John 6. Uh, John's my favorite gospel, and John 6 and John 10 are two of my favorite sections of John. I love all of John, but I love them because it's, it's so intimate. It's so intimate about Jesus' love for me and his people and like the promise that he has. So I read to you the part about Jesus says, it's the will of the Father that he, Jesus, loses none of all that the Father has given to him. So the Father has given people to Jesus. That sounds like Ephesians 1. The Father has given people to Jesus, and Jesus says that it's the will. I've come down to do the will of my Father, and that's to lose none of them. So where did we ever get the idea that God can lose his people? I don't know, but in terms of what the text says. But then Jesus, after saying that, people start grumbling. In John 6, 41, it says, So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I've come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me Mm. unless the father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up on the last day. So who is the one that Jesus, who's the hymn that Jesus raises up on the last day? Let's let's make sure we put it all together now. Who's the hymn that gets raised up? It's the one the Father drew. Well, who was that? It was the one that couldn't come. Couldn't come. Yeah. And so put it together, no one can. Could Jesus be any more explicit? Do we need to try to fight our way out of that? Should we try to get over that? Or do we just need to believe it? Jesus said, no one can come to me. No one has the ability to come to me. So where do we ever get this idea that this man is sort of like this uh, neutral party? He sins sometimes. He's righteous sometimes. Like he's got this free will. He's got to sort of cooperate with God. Jesus says this. No one can. No one can. No one has the ability to come to me unless... Okay, good news. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, because that's bad news. No one can unless the Father who sent me draws him. Okay, great. So the Father has to draw. And I will raise him up. He raises up the one the Father draws, the one that couldn't come. That's what Jesus said. So here's what I've always said. Look, I mean this with all humility because I didn't write this book. I'm a believer. I love Jesus. He saved me. If you want to know where the the doctrines of grace come from, you want like, give give me where the Bible says it. We can give you lots of places, lots of places, overload you with text for sure. But how about a whole discourse from Jesus on it? You want to see what Jesus says that looks like the doctrines of grace? John 6. Read John 6. You'll see it all there. There's a people chosen by the Father, given to Jesus to never lose, to raise up in the last day, and none of them could come apart from God drawing them, and Jesus says, I will raise them up. I will not fail to do it. That's basically the five points. I yeah. mean, there's there's a lot yeah. we would need I mean, to go into in terms of the atonement itself, and that would, I would say, let's go to John 10 for that, in terms of like the sheep, him laying his life down for the sheep and all that stuff. We'll go into some of that in the after show, but there's that is this show was not an exhaustive look at the issue of total inability, we could just sit here for an hour and just go through verse after verse after verse and just read, 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 yeah. read about the nature of man, the will is enslaved, our affections and desires are perverted, all of that. But we wanted to give you a solid foundation. I think it hit the major points. Yeah. And hopefully it was a blessing. And you know, if you want to start really studying this and testing what we're saying by the Word of God, which is what you should be doing, I would strongly encourage you to get um, the five points of Calvinism. Um, who wrote that book? Steele and Thomas, I think. Uh, good book. It just has a great list of scripture, just text after text after text. Highly encourage you to get uh, Lorraine Bettner's book, uh, The Reformed Doctrine of Predestination. It'll bless your life. I think you'll really rather enjoy that. Lots of scripture in there. Uh, the, the, there's There would be a good place to start. Um, great list of scripture actually online. Um, I've gone back to it many years just to give people a list because it's just convenient. Is Travis Carden, C A R D E N dot com, has a list of um, verses for total depravity. And uh, it's just nice. It has it all neatly tight together right there in different categories of the will enslaved and affections, desires perverted, and is everybody dead in sin? All that stuff. And it's just verse after verse after verse. So go to it. 
go to it. But we are going to go to the after show. Uh, if you guys are not all access yet, I encourage you guys to go and sign up for all access. You can join us in the after show. Even join us for the monthly Ask Me Anything. It's a private stream with just all of our uh, friends and ministry partners with me, sometimes Zach, and uh, but mostly me, where we just get to talk to each other for about an hour and uh, do questions and answers. Again, we love to bring you guys into this and bless you as much as we possibly can. So go to apologiastudios.com. Meet us in the after show. We're going to talk more about total depravity, total inability in our series, Defending Calvinism. Thank you guys so much. I am Jeff. They call me the ninja. That is Zachary Conover. See you guys. God don't, bless. Don't forget to go to endabortionnow.com. Go support us over there. We have a number of states coming up next session with bills of abolition. Praise the Lord for that. We need your help. We need your support, your financial support, your prayers for that. God bless you. We'll catch you on the other side. This is The Academy. I am Eli Ayala of Revealed Apologetics, and I will be bringing a six-part series on presuppositional apologetics. What is this called, The Apology Academy? It's just called The Academy. Okay. What's up, everybody? My name is Pastor Jeff Durbin, and you're watching Collision Today. I'm going to be interacting with an atheist on TikTok. So here we go. Unsupervised and unhinged. Welcome back to Cultish the Aftermath. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Ask Me Anything. So you are watching Apologia Radio's after show exclusively for all access.